to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation as usual as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about everyone and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm glad you came back after our opening music. It's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band and you can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to have real conversations with real people, those uh, diagnosed, family and friends, as, lo- as well as business professionals and advocates. Now, before I introduce you to our guest today, I always like to give a couple of shout outs. So first of all, I want to mention Dementia Map. If you're not familiar with it, it's our global resource directory we are building. There are Um, both free and for fee listings that you can have. Everyone is welcome. And there is no cost to the consumer, 24-hour access, and you don't have to make an account. So don't worry about getting hacked or scammed or any of those things. We're not going to be tracking you at all. We're not going to be giving out your information. There you will find about 150 different categories that you can search, as well as our events calendar that has lots of great information in terms of events uh, locally and around the world that you can participate in. I also like to give a couple of shout outs to some organizations that I'm working with. One is the Waters of White Bear. We're going to be doing it in a a live event on October 21st, and that will start at 4 p.m. Central Time. You do need to wear a mask, but you can find more information on that on Dementia Map or go to alzheimerspeaks.com. And then on the last Wednesday of each month, I facilitate a support group for care partners. And that is sponsored by Brookdale of North Oaks here in Minnesota. We meet at the Shoreview Community Center at 10 a.m. Central, again, the last uh, Wednesday of the month. And then we also do a virtual support group, which is sponsored by Arthur Senior Care. And that we do the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month. And we do that at one o'clock central virtual radio at all. Again, you can reach out to me at things I want to cover. There are a couple of international conferences that I think you might be interested in. The Plymouth International Virtual Dementia Conference is coming up on October 27th, November 3rd. And November 10th, I will personally be speaking on the 27th, but they have a great lineup and it is free. And then the research charity Grace is having their uh, conference, which is called Together for Dementia on November 2nd. And that has a minimal fee. I think it's like $15. But again, they're going to be having speakers from around the world. And I think you'll find that uh, very beneficial as well. One last thing. We're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker. And we will be right back. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Well, today, like I said, we're going to have Chris Price with us, and he is a family physician who has been practicing about 25 years. He's out in California, and we're going to talk about his book, Allison's Gambit, and I'm really excited. This is his first novel, but it was actually inspired 
by patients of his who have been caregiving for those with dementia. This is just going to be a good conversation. We've been talking offline. And finally, I said, I got to push the button because we're saying too many good things. So welcome, Chris. I'm, I'm so excited to have you with us today. Oh, well, thank you, Lori. It's, it's quite a pleasure. Before I start on my line of questioning, I always like to ask everyone who comes to the show, have you been personally touched by dementia in your own family or circle of friends? You know, oddly, no, until really quite recently. And it was a surprise. And you suddenly realize no matter how prepared you think you are, you're not. And yes, it, it was really a surprise. Yeah, it is very different when it hits home. I remember um, speaking one time and there was a man, it was probably a group of a thousand people. And there was a man in one of the the first tables and he just started sobbing. I mean, hysterically sobbing. And one of his colleagues ran out and got a roll of toilet paper and brought him back because he he just couldn't even get up and, and move. He was just like paralyzed. And I talked with him afterwards and I said, are you, are you doing okay? And he said, yeah, he says, I have been in this business for 21 years as an executive director. And I have been giving people advice that I truly believed all of that time. Mm -hmm. But my dad has dementia and I am seeing how I have done it all wrong. And he, you know, he just felt horrible hearing, you know, new ways and feeling how, how different Um, that approach would make. And so it's really, really common that we have a lot of people giving advice that truly believe it's sound advice. But like you said, your perception totally changes changes the second that door opens, your life has forever changed. But the gift with that, I think, is it gives us opportunities to learn new ways that can enrich all of our lives. That reminds me, there was a patient I had, this was probably 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. and her husband went into the hospital. I took care of him in the hospital. He passed away. She comes to my office and she said, hey, when's my husband coming home? And I said, well, he passed away last week. And she cried and cried and cried because she had forgotten that he had passed away. And the next time she came in, you think I would have learned from my mistake. I did not. Um, it was probably a month later and she said, Hey, when's Bob coming home? And I said, but he's not, he's passed away. Same thing happened. It was agonizing. And on the third time I did learn and I said, Oh, by next week, he's still struggling a little bit, but it'll come home next week. And she was totally fine. Yep. Totally fine with that. And well, it was a learning lesson and I've learned over and over again, the truth isn't always your friend. Oh, that's a beautiful way to put it. I, and I know so many families struggle about the, the fiblet or the therapeutic lie or whatever you want to term it as. It's like, I, I've always been honest, you know, with my parent or my loved one or my significant other, whoever it is, and I'm not going to start now. But there comes this time when you realize it's not about right or wrong. It's, it's not about our linear time frames. It's about their comfort. And is it worth to keep them spinning and reliving those emotions all over again when it's brand new to them every single time? And uh, I I think once um, anybody, you know, family or professional understands that there's no going back. I mean, you really, you really get that comfort care masters all. You know, it really is about stepping into their world and and bringing them comfort uh, versus corrective care. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It is at the end of the day, when she left my office, was she happier with me telling her he's coming home in a, a next week? Much happier. And what did I have to gain from telling her the truth? Absolutely nothing. And not only is it difficult for her, but anybody she's going back to. You know, I, I found like with my own mom, I was shocked at the stuff she could, she could retain. And it was like, no, that, pick the joy, mom. Don't, don't pick the stuff that's going to spin. But sometimes she would, she would just get really aggravated over small things. And it's like, this is so not worth it. You know, and sometimes I think we think, well, they'll forget, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they hold on to those feelings because they're, they're so ingrained or that person, that moment is so important to them. 
And um, yeah, I, I learned that the hard way too, mm-hmm. <laughs> with, yeah. with, with my own mom. It's not something you just are born knowing, that's, that's for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you knew dementia was in your future, would it change how you live today? You know, I, I wrestled with this question a lot, and I think the answer is yes. And I hadn't really given it a lot of thought. Is you know, there is a there is a gene that can increase your risk for dementia, but it's not an obvious one. I think so often we want to get a DNA profile and let us know what's going to happen, but it still only changes percentages. And I think the the but the root of your question, if I actually knew. I would be much more, I would plan a lot better. Um, I think it's just like when I, you know, any like attorney says, you know, you really should do some real estate planning. You probably should. You should sort of say, who's going to be the person who takes care of you? And I would definitely, I I would have to have that much more dialed in than I would if I didn't expect it in my future. Well, or what, what brings you comfort? What brings you joy? I mean, really identifying those things. I think we take those things for granted, but we need to identify those in in case it does hit us. And what if it's too late for us to be able to communicate that to others? That's a really important factor. I, you know, I, I do a lot of discussions with people with dementia and Susan Session, who has since, since passed really hit home um, when she talks about how families kind of like to downsize and clean out mm-hmm. and she, and she told her family, she said, I know all of my stuff is junk to you, but it's not to me. And so she wrote on all of her, all of her pieces, when she got it, why she got it and what it means to her. And she said, what you're not realizing is when you are throwing out something that's valuable to me, you're throwing out my memories and I'm already losing them. So please don't add to it. I mean, it's just a really small thing that we don't think about, but what a difference if you have those things that give you comfort surrounding you and, you know, seeing people dismiss that and that's gotta be really frustrating. It would be. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, getting back to your question, I also think what really started me on this journey and, you know, you talk about how I think someone can change when it really kind of hits home. It it was a particular patient of mine who made me look at dementia quite differently. And I do my best. Someone's she's smoking. And I said, Hey, you know what? You really should stop smoking. And she looked me in the eye with such almost defiance and said, I will never stop smoking. And okay, why not? She said, I've been taking care of my mom with dementia for the last five, six years. It was a miserable experience. And I don't want to go through that ever again. I don't want anyone to go through that for me. And so her conclusion was her new philosophy. If she dies younger, she won't get dementia and she'll die younger by smoking. It was so shocking to me, this, the whole philosophy about it. I started to explore how bad was that caregiving experience for her? How difficult was that emotionally? And once I saw it in her, I started to see it in so many other people, the, the strain that it required. And I started to understand her philosophy more. And yes, in a way, she's saying I'm living my life differently. I like to think when I've thought of it more personally for myself, every day becomes more precious. And we really need to focus on our relationships, our friendships, and just doing what we like. Don't, don't wait for the future. Do the things we like now. Oh, I agree. And you think, you know, even like with smoking, you think of cancer, but cancer is much more accepted in our society. There's a, there's a lot more support, there's treatment, um, you know, good, bad, or ugly, depending on how you want to look at that and what it is you have, but you're still going to end up with some of those dilemmas at hand, but it's more um, normalized, I guess, in society. And uh, yeah, it's, it's too, it's too bad, but again, everybody has to process their own way and there's no right or there's no wrong. I believe anyways, everyone has their right to, to be able to choose. Let's talk about nursing homes and 
not too many people say sign me up you know, <laughs> for that one. Though so my mom was actually one that did. I'll, I can tell you that story later. But what can you imagine that would make that a, a better way to care for, you know, our elders in particular and, and people with dementia? How do we remove that stigma? It's a great question. I think one of the biggest stigmas is you, you said it exactly. Everybody says, I won't put my parent in a nursing home because then the parent said the whole time, don't ever put me in a nursing home. Instead of saying, you know what, we need the best care for you. And at some point, frankly, when caregivers burn out, often the nursing home is better care. They're able to do more than you possibly could by yourself. And so when we need to, I think, first make that transition more acceptable, that people say it's not a failure to go to a nursing home. It is a goal to get the best care for your loved one. And then I think second is supportive care is so helpful. And I feel that just like you said, if you have cancer, you get support. You, and your caregivers are, are coming and helping you out. You get so many things. To say someone just needs a little bit more help cooking or cleaning or showering, there is some money for that, but really little, nothing compared to if you actually had like small cell carcinoma of the lung and you were going through chemotherapy, people come out and help. Um, it's much harder. And so the cost becomes so burdensome. I feel that if we shifted more money to nursing homes, right now it's so bare bone, it would feel a lot more like a college dormitory and that would be spectacular. We often have, we smile when we think of college years were great. There were so many opportunities. There were movies, there was clubs, there was chess, there was all sorts of things. And that sense of a, a nursing home as being just drab with nothing there is in part because there is just so much money per patient. And if we raise that up, if we could let nursing homes have a bigger budget, there would be so much more excitement and interest in nursing homes and it would be a better sell. I mean, could you imagine saying instead of that place down the street that you saw that looked like nobody was doing anything, it was quiet, there were no activities, a different nursing home where you walked in there and said, stuff is happening. They're bringing people in from the community. There's music going on all the time. There's like a live band. There is interesting book clubs going constantly. You can do whatever you want because it's college all over again. That would be such a greater sell. And I just don't feel the money we spend on end of life, it wouldn't change all that much to provide that. And, but instead, most of it's just provided by families who suddenly get sticker shock of that $8,000 a month nursing home bill that they've got to come up with, which is a crazy high number. And it's a place that it seems like no one wants to go. Well, and it's not that much different than memory care and some even assisted livings out there, you know, when you, when you really analyze it. And, you know, I just interviewed, in fact, it aired today, um, some people from the UK and they are brainstorming a new living environment called Symbiosha. And it's about creating beautiful space um, with wonderful gardens and sculptures and you know, one of the things she said is, wouldn't it be nice if even if you were in a hospital bed in end of life, that you could go up to the rooftop and have a glass of wine and watch the sunset with your family? She's like, why can't we do that for people? You know, why can't we? Because, you know, we haven't thought that it was possible, but there's a lot of creativity that's happening right now, which I think is because of COVID. Everyone's kind of experienced that isolation and that loneliness and going, wow. If I'm feeling it, what are, what are my parents and my friends feeling like who are living in these environments? And I do, I think there's so much that can be done. My mom, like, it, as I said, she chose to go to the nursing home and our family was like, but that's not the plan, you know, <laughs> because, <laughs> but my, my dad ended up being there because he had brain cancer. And um, for whatever reason, one day, instead of taking the elevator, he fell down two flights of steps. And he was never able to move back home independently. And so the plan was always for my mom to live, you know, with, with myself and my family. 
And one morning, probably three weeks in, and we got along great. Uh, she woke up, just clears a bell, total clarity. This is a woman who couldn't pick out her clothes on what she should wear, snow boots or flip flops. And she said, I want to move into the nursing home. And literally my jaw dropped and I said, but that's not the plan. You know, you go to all this work to try to figure it out, um, but you still have to be fluid. And I said, mom, why do you want to move into the nursing home? And she said, we've been together 49 and a half years and I'm not leaving them now. She remembered that. And I'm like, uh -huh. I will make that happen. But again, right away, the nursing home, which was lovely, um, said, you know, your dad's got a roommate, we'll move him, your mom can move in there. And I said, no. They're like, well, what do you mean? You just said you, and I, you want her to move in. And I said, she doesn't have to watch him die. We're going to lose two of them. They're two peas in a pod. I said, I want her on the highest functioning floor because she was really social. And I want her to have one meal and one activity every day on that floor. And the rest of the day, I will be with her and I'll escort her to be with my dad. And so when my dad died, like three months later, and I was lucky I had the flexibility because I, you know, was self-employed and she was totally acclimated. She had made friends. She knew the routine. And even though my, my dad was gone, she didn't really remember that unless we brought it up and corrected her on something, <laughs> you know, and made her relive that. But it was a beautiful thing. And and as much as I even struggled with that decision, because in real estate, I was always helping people transition. And I knew how much they struggled. And even though I believed that they could get better care and their needs met, when it came to my mom, you know, my, my you know, cape came on and superwoman and I, you know, I can do better. Um, which kind of surprised me that my ego came out that strong, though I did step forward and I arranged it. But I'll never, ever forget the day I walked in and they were doing an activity. And like you said, that sense of community. And they were just horseshoed around the activities director. And she was holding up a like a Oprah magazine. And it was it was like a fold out thing, like four pages. And it was just all flowers and gardens. And they were having conversations about gardening and the colors and memories. And I, I just stood in the doorway, just in tears going, oh my God, I could never give her that. I, I could never be her peer. As much as I want to give her that sense, there's still something different about a peer group. I would agree. Yes. And that was, that was a life, one of those life changing moments for me on that. But yeah, I'd love to see, um, Oh, I'd love to see our terminology even with, with housing change. Why does it have to be nursing home? Why can't it be something more friendly? I mean, there's a broad base of who goes in. I mean, even transitional care, nobody really wants to go there either, you know, but transitional means, okay, I'll be out at least. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. Um, so I, I think some of it is in our, in our verbiage. We've got to get a little bit more, more creative with that. I want to talk about the book, um, Allison's Gambit. What made you decide to write it? I mean, there must have been something that just clicked in you. I know writing a book takes a ton of effort and time. Uh, so so what, was, what was the turning point for you to make this a reality and push this out to the world? You know, it's funny. My friend, when I uh, grew up with uh, in college, he said, I never thought of you as a writer mm -hmm. and uh, essentially implying I wasn't that good in college. And I said, well, you know, I, go, I don't think I ever really had something I really felt strongly about. But once she started making me essentially realize a different philosophy, that got me started. So I said, I'm going to just start writing. Then once I started writing, I started seeing it everywhere. It seemed like every patient of mine, somewhere along the line, oh, you're new to, you know, Sacramento, where I'm from. Um, what brought you here? And invariably, it would be caregiving. Sometimes it was a job, but if it was that job, it pulled. And now I had to now bring my relative from somewhere because they suddenly can't be on their own. And you realize this web was so entrenched and really difficult. And I saw it everywhere. And I kept on finding that there were not many resources. And people didn't struggle with the new changes in their life, like a new job or you know getting married or whatever it is. They could do well with that. The caregiving um, became such a challenge. And so once I started looking at it, I 
felt like it, it gave me more and more writing material. And the more I spoke, the more I realized we need more, more people to listen to this. And so the desire to publish it said, I want people to read this and I want to challenge people to start thinking about what's going to happen at the end of their life and what would they want. And I think if we start thinking about that now, we will change the culture, like you said, of mm -hmm. having things that don't seem like they are negative, that they're still positive. Uh, I remember seeing the movie ages ago, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and it never, cro it, it never crossed my mind a funeral could be a happy time until I saw that movie. And I'm going, why isn't it a happy time? It should be a celebration. And we should look at end of life as a positive, not so much as a negative. And so, yes, in the end, I feel like the goal of that book is to give sympathy to the caregiver and a positivity in the supportive care hospice time that I think we'll all eventually need. Yeah. And I'm just going to give a plug. I don't know if you're familiar with Compassion and Choices, an end of life organization, but they actually have healthcare directives for dementia. And so for me, I, you know, I, I thought I completed it, but I didn't save it and I didn't print it. So I got to go back in there. Um, but I want to, I want to have that in place in case I do get dementia, you know, and it, and it can um, overlap with other things other than just dementia as well, but it's very detailed and it really makes you think of specific situations that could occur and it's totally free and you can either fill it out and print it out. Don't forget to push your button like I did. <laughs> and then, um, or you can make an account and you can leave it there. So you can always go back and update it, you know, every year, every five years, whenever you, you know, redo your, your will or over, you know, look at your assets and stuff again, but they made it really, really simple. And I just, um, I think that that's such an important piece, everything it's got it. We've got to make it easy for people to be able to look at these mm -hmm. things. I was going to say, you also bring up the fact that often when you say I'm coming in to bring someone because I'm wondering if they've got dementia, the process is not as easy as you think. If you said, hey, I wonder if you've got heart failure, process is really clear. It's very obvious. You're going to get an echo. You're going to get the ejection fraction. You're going to know. Process with dementia is a relatively poor tool. And clinicians, are, I think, are relatively poorly trained in deciding on, oh, yes, they do indeed have dementia or not. Is it mild, moderate, severe? And then how are we gonna treat it? And so instead, often I think, we pass the buck and say, well, see a neurologist. There are not many neurologists. Um, and so a neurologist appointment here could be four months, easy. Yep. Um, and then you might need a follow-up. That's another few months. And it could be a year for diagnosis. And by that time, the family is going, what are we gonna do? And the desperation starts getting really high and often, there's just not a clear picture of where do you go from here? And do we take medicines? Do we not take medicines? What do we take? If I start getting side effects, what happens? It's not very, the help is not really there. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And you know, I mentioned to you earlier, we created Dementia Map to kind of help. And one of my dreams would be for physicians to connect their patients to that site so that they would have hope. Because one of the things I hear from physicians, and I don't know if you felt this, but a lot of physicians say, I, I don't know any resources. You know, I mean, there's, you guys take a lot of training and, and education, but there's, I mean, there's a lot of disease out there to cover as well. And so how much can you really know? But if, if the doctor that was giving the diagnosis or even a preliminary that this could be a situation gave them some information because most people around the world will still say very few even get a number to the Alzheimer's Association or society or, you know, any major organization. What they hear is here's a prescription. Don't forget to make an appointment <laughs> to come back and um, get your affairs in order. And that's what they hear as they're walking out the door. Right. And, and so that just puts people into really a sinkhole, you know, that they're just spinning around. And when anybody um, runs across a new diagnosis, bottom line is you don't know what you don't know. You don't even know what to ask for. And so you need some kind of guidance. And we're seeing more clinics, but not enough, hiring social workers to help make that connect. 
But even if they could say, you know, here, here's a resource that has a lot of different resources, A, it could maybe reduce time on physicians and their nurses for trying to find support and allow families the freedom to really choose mm -hmm. what's going to meet their needs. Because I know as a daughter, for me, I got frustrated even when I did find someone who was willing to help. I was thinking, I've talked to you 10 minutes. There's no way you really know our family and what our needs are. And, you know, I, as a daughter, I wanted to be able to explore that and, and make some choices. And I hear that a lot from people, but I think that could revolutionize it, even just getting the diagnosis or where do you go even prior to walking in the door? Cause there's so much shame and stigma of getting diagnosed. There was something out that you know, a third of the people probably aren't diagnosed. And yet now with COVID and the fires and the after effects of both of those, we know that's going to increase cognitive impairment as well. So, I mean, we're talking massive numbers here that we need to deal with and we need to get a grip fast to be, to be able to help these families. I'd be curious to know one other thing that came up in my mind when you were talking is you know, when, when the patient comes in, I, or usually the caregiver comes in and asks a question, should I take away the keys to the car? You got a 10, 15 minute visit. That is not a 10, 15 minute answer. And it is so difficult because if you take away the keys to the car, then what do they do at home? When do they get their groceries? How do they do things? It's so difficult. And the other thing that made me, I thought of when you were speaking, and I'd love to know your opinion on this, the gullibility factor seniors are getting preyed on all the time anyway. Um, those with dementia will seem to write out the checkbook to almost any organization. And it, it, how do you deal with that? It's so hard, but I, have you heard much of that? I, I call it the gullibility factor, but I find it tremendous. Oh, there is a great program out there. It's called Careful. It's on Dementia Map. And I hadn't heard of it before, but they will actually analyze, uh, you put in all their accounts, and they'll see if a bill was paid twice, or if it wasn't paid at all, or if there was a large amount drawn out, and they will tick you and let you know, activities not normal ahead of time. Oh, and wow. it's really cool. And it's very inexpensive. I had a, a, a very close friend who was scammed. Um, and, you know, she always thought of herself as savvy, but, you know, she was starting to have memory issues and a scammer called her up and said, you know, we need your help. We, we need you to go to the bank and get $4,500 and go to target. And we want you to buy all these, um, gift cards. But, uh, before you leave the store, you need to, you need to read off all the numbers of the cards to us. So there she was, she bought them all. And then she stood over to the side and she was calling and she was giving the numbers out. Well, staff at Target realized what was happening. And, you know, they hung up and said, nope, we're gonna, we're gonna go back. We're gonna refund all your money and oh. you need to get this back into the bank. But she never recovered from that. I mean, that just took her off the deep end. Her daughter and her friend had to get involved in terms of changing accounts and going through. And from, uh, from an ego standpoint and a feeling of independence, it crushed her. And no matter how much we told her, hey, this happens to all of us. You know, I had it happen to me for um, my uh, energy company called. They came up on my phone like they were Excel Energy and said, hey, we, you know, you're behind. We're going we're gonna to cut you off. And, you know, you panic immediately. And thank God I remembered, I just paid that bill, you know, so I hung up from them and I called the energy company and they said, yeah, they're getting really savvy. They can clone our phone. So it actually comes up saying it's us. This is something that we really have to be able to help protect families with and, and careful is a, is a wonderful, wonderful program to do that, but it's getting involved and it's learning to step in as a family member or a friend without taking over. So you can maybe start writing the bills, but that doesn't mean you have to do that alone. You know, they could still maybe sign for them and you're, you're processing, you're filing, but so often because we are such a fast paced community, we're just like, I can do it faster. You know, just give them to me. I'll, I'll just take care of it. And, 
And we don't realize what we're taking away from someone's purpose and value and independence as an individual. Oh, that, that site sounds great. I mean, that sounds like a lot of good resources. I've not heard of that. Yeah. It's, it's amazing and it's real simple. Another one is um, GrandPad. And GrandPad is a communication system where people, um, if they want to text or call, they can do it by picture, they can do it by voice. Nobody from the outside, uh, outside the circle can communicate with that person. So if they use it as their phone, a scammer is not going to get in. If it gets lost, there's an alarm to be able to push a button and find it's under a, a you know, maybe a couch cushion. And if someone does steal it, they can't use it because it's not, it's not an open source. Um, they can't, you know, get rid of everything and then sell it as an iPad itself. So there's a lot of cool things that are out there. But again, how do we get everybody connected to these? That's the trick. And more and more are coming online, just like with you writing your book, once you see the need, people are stepping up and stepping in and going, we can do better, but we have to connect the dots and we have to be able to, to refer people out. I do want to get to, you had mentioned hospice. And why do you think it takes family so long to accept help? You know, when you see them overwhelmed, but there's like, no, we don't want to go there. No, no. No, I, you know, I think it's a question of, and I've seen it when I was training, you never wanted somebody to quote, die on your ship. That was a, considered a failure. And so death being seen as a failure, I think it's a big part of the problem. So you got to continue at all costs. It doesn't matter what you have to do to prolong things instead of saying, but are we gaining anything at this point? Is, is my loved one happy still? Are we all happy with this? And I feel like once we switch over to saying, you know, the treatment feels a lot worse, getting up and having to move and go to the hospital and get this treatment and coming back is starting to become so burdensome that maybe it would be better just to stay at home. It invariably, everyone who seems to make that switch mentally and says, I'm not going, I'm just staying here. I'm not going to get dialysis. I'm not going to get whatever that, uh, life-saving treatment is. I've never seen it backfire. They always seem happier. Everybody's happier. And the only thing I see over and over again, it takes so long to occur. And I feel like what I see is because I see people, you know, generation after generation, time after time, I see it so frequently. It's so commonplace for me to look at it early and say, do it now. Do it when you've got a year to go and you can get supportive care. And but usually I'm, I'm fought by at least one or two relatives who say, no, 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 we've got to do everything we possibly can. Yeah. Um, and I think doing everything isn't necessarily doing everything to make the person happier. And I think comfort and happiness need to have a higher priority than length of time lived. Oh, I, I so agree with you. I'm, um, I'm 62 now. And so I'm having a lot more people, you know, my age and older pass around me. And I have seen so many people fight the battle and many of them are ready to give up, but they feel like they can't because their family's not ready to let them go. And yet I have had the honor of being with many people when they pass and be supportive of their decision. That is such a blessed gift to be able to be there at the end and, you know, say everything that needs to be said and giving them that opportunity to live fully and graciously. And I think that's what's missing is we're not living graciously. We're, we're, we're more worried about fear or judgment by others in terms of our decision making. And so you know, I've already told my daughter and, and, uh, you know, I never, you never know what's going to happen, but I've said, if I, if I get cancer, I just want you to know, there's a good chance. I am not going to even start treatment. And, you know, some people might look at me and go, well, well you know, but you don't know. And I said, I know, I don't know, but I have seen so many families anguish and, and I would rather live a quality of life try some other types of healing that might not be as damaging, I guess, to my body 
and in my soul and live with quality and be able to be an example of letting go graciously. I mean, we're not meant to be here forever. And I, and yet there's that pressure to be here forever. And, and that's just not realistic. I, and again, you know, some people might, you know, say, well, that's kind of crazy. And it's like, again, everybody has their right of choice. I'm not trying to convince anybody of that. I may totally change my mind if that hits me. But I'm just saying from my perspective right now, I would, I want to live peacefully and gracefully with my loved ones around me without pity or sadness or illness that, you know, has me hugging a toilet or sleeping, you know, 20 hours a day. Right. You know, it's funny, my publisher, who I think is fantastic, Vinny Kinsella, he developed the cover for my book. And Mm -hmm. it was partly because of what I was trying to, the emotion I was trying to convey. In the end, we are going to die of something. And so it's sort of this, uh, like, wheel of fortune wheel. And it's just all these different ways to possibly succumb and realize none of them are good. And so it's not like once you get past whatever cancer you've got, they say, oh, you're cancer free, that you'll suddenly have a perfectly happy you know, death later on. There's going to be something else. And whatever that something else is, when we get there, I think we should say, you know, I, again, I'm choosing comfort and happiness over just extra time because extra time will just lead you to the next thing that comes up on your wheel of fortune. Um, and so I, I did like that image because I think that's one I think we should live with and or at least recall in the end that in the end, something is going to happen. Yep. And you can call it wheel of fortune or kind of a, to me, it reminded me of the carny wheel and the click, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and the guy calling out, you know, how much you weigh or whatever it's going to be or right. how many pounds you slam down. But it, in the end, we don't have control over over that. Um, You know, we can try to prevent, but even like with dementia, you can do all the right things and still, you know, get hit with this, this disease in one shape or form. And it doesn't care how rich or poor you are. It doesn't care, you know, about much of anything, you know, if it knocks on your door, it's there and you you have to deal with it. So we have to come up with, with a, a better philosophy. I, what I find with hospice is people always think, well, it's the end of life. Well, and I always say, well, you know, my mom was on hospice and then she improved because she's getting all this extra attention and she lived like three and a half more years. Yeah. And then she, then she went on again for her, her very, you know, end of life thing or palliative care. They don't understand this is about support and comfort. And, uh, you know, I have a, um, a neighbor who's not going through dementia, but is caring for her husband. I, I don't think people, I think they acknowledge verbally that they're exhausted in that, in that care sometimes, but they don't, they don't look in the mirror of what it's actually doing to them and their soul and their relationship. And so, you know, Larry is just, he's now on hospice, he's at home. And I can tell they're just both breathing easier. You know, the battle, the battle isn't, um, is hard anymore. You know, they've come to a a common grounds of, of inevitability and, and peace. And it's so nice to not hear her voice quivering and the exhaustion. And I think sometimes, even though people acknowledge they're tired, they don't understand to the extent of, of what is happening. And it happens not just to the care partner, but for those, you know, living through it too, they have the same emotions, you know, that they're going through in this, in the same types of struggles, they might not be able to say them, but we have to learn to read those nonverbals, which again, I think is another skill set we really have to teach people in terms of empathy and communication and uh, all of that. Right. I learned that a lot. I, I do home visits. I feel like I'm one of the few doctors who does home visits. Oh, wow. You it are. Is, it is a completely different feel seeing them in my office and going to their house. And that's when you see, you talk about that, that language, the body language. Are they, are they too tired? You see it so much more. People really get ready for the office. It's like going to church. They're mm-hmm. dressed up. They're ready to go. And you see them at their best. When you see them at their home, you sometimes go, oh God, they can't keep it going on. Why are we doing this? Um, this is too much for them. It can be very different in the house. Um, 
And then you sometimes see also the, the frankly, the chaos of, wow, I don't know how we're getting these medicines in correctly. Um, and that's honestly where hospice, we you say they do better on hospice. Sometimes it's just because someone's going in, checking in and making sure they're taking the medicines like they're supposed to. And all of a sudden their heart failure improves yep. because they are taking their medicines regularly. Their diabetes improves. And I, I, I see that over and over again. I think it's also with hospice is they now don't feel alone. You know, there's, there's one person to connect with. And again, like with my neighbor, she, I could just hear her relief. And she says, they told me over and over again, I don't call 911. I call them. They're my first call, my only call other than family, but that, and, and she, you could just feel the relief in her voice because through the system, she, you know, in and out of the hospital, the stress of that, um, and the, the lack of being cared for, the shortage of staff, all of those are additional stressors that people are feeling these days. And, you know, it's just so important that people understand this will help both parties. And, you know, when you mentioned about dressing up and going to church, um, I hear this from families all the time too, is we went to the doctor to get diagnosed and boy, they were on their game. And I'm like, well, yeah, they can do that too. You know, a person with dementia, it, you know, just depends on the day and the person. I mean, all of that is fluid and uh, families get so frustrated. Like, I don't even think they believe what I'm saying. <laughs> you know? And, and pretty much any family member can, can relate to that. But it's, again, how do you communicate with the doctor? And I know for me, I found a lot of times I would send an email to the nurse ahead of time because I couldn't always talk to the doctor. And so just being able to send, these are our list of concerns. So when we came in, I wasn't always the bad guy bringing them up, but the doctor could say, well, these are kind of common things that are happening. Are you, are you seeing this? And then it was more of a norm. And then there wasn't this hatred about, you're just tattling on me you know, because a lot of families feel that. And so we really look for the doctors to be supportive with that. In terms of your book, Allison's Gamut, who is your target market? I mean, is it, is it caregivers? Is it professionals? Is it, is it everybody? Um, I think everybody needs to understand what it's like, but Mm -hmm. without a doubt, it's the caregiver. That's the one that I have the most sympathy for. That's the one I, I really grew to understand was struggling far more than I think they have to. And I would argue that the goal of the book and probably your goal as well is saying, we really need to address this need that is huge, that is out there. Because as soon as you say it, everyone goes, oh my gosh, I need help. Oh, I could use some help. And where do you get help? And it shouldn't be that way. And my hope is by acknowledging the caregiver, the distress that they're under, that maybe we'll start turning things and people will say, we've got to do better. We we can't just let this go on. We have to do better than we are doing. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, being a caregiver, a care partner, a carer, a care companion, all of those words, um, it's not about putting on your Superman or Superwoman cape and doing it yourself. You know, we are always better together And yet there's, I think, especially with our elders, um, there's this feeling of, I need to do it alone. People are going to look at me less than if I can't care for my wife or my husband or, you know, my mom or my dad. And I, I think people, especially in this day and age too, there's so much judgment and people are feeling very comfortable making comments about that, which they don't know any detail about. <laughs> about. And, you know, that's not a good thing. You know, that's not a good thing. And we have to understand everybody is going through something. We have to be much more gracious. If it's in the grocery line and someone's having difficulty checking out, um, and I know I've been guilty of rolling the eyes, looking at my watch or my phone when I used to wear a watch and, and going, oh, come on, you know, I got to get going <laughs> type thing. And I, I try to do better on that. And, um, but I, uh, but sometimes I miss and sometimes I'm not so, so gracious. And, and yet I've learned to try to let go of that, not beat myself up too much, knowing I'll always have another opportunity to improve. 
And if, if you're recognizing that you're doing things like that, that's half the battle because you know what, that could be you, that could be any of us. And how do we, how do we want to be dealt with? And it's nice to see dementia friendly communities, you know, popping up. Um, It's nice to see businesses that are becoming dementia friendly clinics um, and hospitals that are starting to work on that as well, even though COVID's kind of sidetracked, like hospitals, some hospital systems now have a purple angel uh, wristband, you know, it's just your hospital admission wristband, but it has the purple angel global symbol on it. So anybody who checks that will immediately know this person is uh, dealing with some cognitive issues. So they're not going to give them their discharge orders alone. You know, they're, um, and, and maybe there will be volunteers to be able to sit with that person. Again, during COVID, that's much more difficult, but um, there are sunflower lanyards that the um, airports are starting to use for people with invisible disabilities to identify them. So if they need help um, maneuvering. You know, so we're making a ton of progress. COVID has kind of pushed us back, but I think it's opened people's eyes and, and made them realize we can all do better. And every single one of us has the ability to improve a family who is dealing with dementia's life. Every single one, I don't care what the age is, we can all improve that just sometimes by being really simple, just by being kind, yeah. just by saying hello, you know, can I help you carry that bag? Do you need directions? I mean, so often it doesn't take much to have a large impact on someone else, but I think people have forgotten kind of our power of one and how we can really affect the world if we just choose to realize we have the power to do that. Well said, yeah. Anything else that we haven't covered? Um, one of the things I should probably ask you is, in the book, why don't you explain how it's broken down to people in terms of, you know, how would they read it? Some are like resource books, some you want to read from um, cover to end, others you can dive into chapters. How did you design yours? I always like to hear that from the author. I, I think it, the design was comparing and contrasting. So she had two parents, obviously. Her dad died relatively quickly, and that's right at the start of the book. And it sounds awful. But then very quickly, you realize, she says, but that death, I was able to deal with much more easily. And so the next part is understanding why was it difficult to deal with her mom's death? And I think a big part in this is sort of that guilt and where do you go from there is she recognizes that her mom doesn't even really acknowledge what she's doing. So she's doing all this work for her mother, pulling her away from her family or job and I want that to be the real focus for most caregivers because I guess maybe that's sort of told through my eyes, that sandwich generation of, I'm giving up all of this and I don't even know if there was a point to it. Um, For example, I hear over and over again, I want longevity. I want to live long enough so I can see my daughter get married. I can see, you know, get my grandchildren. But she realizes that her mom doesn't even remember her grandchildren. She doesn't remember her wedding day. And I feel that the reader, when they read it, they can almost read at any point, they're seeing those struggles. And then I think the middle of the book is the dealing with the medical community. And that's one thing I feel like I do a little bit differently. The, I walked to the doctor and what was it like? And how lonely, isolating, and you've got no information, but go that part I feel is going to be very helpful for the reader because I think they're going to recognize and go, that wasn't just me. Um, And maybe we can improve on that. I really feel like we need to improve on that. There are so few geriatricians in this country. Um, There are not enough neurologists. There There are fewer and fewer of both every day, it feels like. And so going to shows like yours and realizing there are resources, but where do you find them? And the final bit of the book, I would argue, is this should, there should be much more celebration of our current life and what we have to go on and utilize the help of everybody. When she started turning to her friends and let her family kind of work and help her, she became happier. She became a better person overall. And I would argue it came later for her than it should have, because I think that's what happens. And so part of the idea of reading and learning from others is 
you learn from others and go, I don't want to make that mistake. Mm -hmm. you, I think over and over again, at the end of the book, you will go, why didn't she enlist her friends earlier? Why did she shut them out? And again, it's that, that sense of shame, I think that's just way too big. And so I think the person who finishes the book will say, I should have less shame. I'm a caregiver. It's not shameful. And I should be happier with the job I'm doing. Yeah. When you talk about friends and shame, I know for me, I know I was taking care of my dad that had um, brain cancer and then my mom with dementia. And I had, I had girlfriends that were once a week, they'd get together for coffee and they would call me and call me and call me. And I would just say, I can't, I can't, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Cause I was still working. I was a mom. I was married that time. I, you know, I was doing all these things for my folks running over to their house, sometimes three and four times just to do what you need to do. And for me, I saw literally my friends as a burden, another thing I had to do and not enough time to do it. And I had to prioritize what was important. And I put my folks ahead of my, I put everybody ahead of myself. And so um, one day I actually, they called me up and said, come on, you got to come meet, you know, just for whatever time you can give. And I, I will never forget this. And we laugh about it now, but I said, Okay, I'll come. I'll give you 15 minutes. It was like, roll out the red carpet. Here I come, you know? And I said that literally to get them off my back. It wasn't because I wanted to go see them. It was like, I want this phone call to stop because it's one more thing in my face that I can't do, that I want to do, but I don't feel I can do. And so I, I sat down, I had coffee. We laughed and cried for two hours. And what I realized was, and I thank God they didn't give up on me, was as a care partner, I had no idea how empty I was until I got filled. And every week forward two hours, because I knew I was a better person, not only for myself, my family, the ones I was caring for, um, but just the world in general, you know, I probably wasn't rolling my eyes so much at the grocery store and checking out and, and feeling that, that exhaustion in that panic, because it, it, they really, they, they filled my soul. And I didn't realize how drained I had gotten because you're so busy being busy. It's a tough role to balance, but I, I would say to friends and family, you had mentioned how she did better once she let friends and family in. I, you know, my, my brothers would call me a control freak. I would call myself very organized. <laughs> and so we kind of had this battle and, you know, they they were wondering where I would get all these stories. And I was just like shocked. And then I thought, oh my gosh, it's because you guys haven't been around. And then we went a little bit deeper in that conversation and, you know, they said, well, we didn't feel like we could compete with you or you would be judging how we were going to care. And I, you know, my standards were up here and, but I didn't realize I was really giving that off for them not to participate. But yet I, like I told them, I said, I'll take some responsibility, but you're not putting all that blame on me because we could have had this conversation sooner. You were very comfortable with me handling this. So you didn't have to get pulled away either. And now after dad died, you're just realizing what you lost out on. And so those conversations are really important. And, you know, I joke when I speak these days and say, I finally have realized that, you know, nobody wants to be tied to me 24 seven, as great <laughs> as I might think I am. If it's a person with dementia or not, we all like that variety in our lives. And every person, as long as it's a healthy relationship, they're mm -hmm. bringing something to the table. And we need to allow them to do that because it lightens the load and makes it easier for everybody. And most importantly, it's life enhancing for the person you're caring for. And that's a lesson I, I really wish I would have learned earlier, you know, in the journey. So now I just pass it along, kind of like what you're doing, you know, with your book, you just, you have to pass it along and try to make it easier for, for the next person. Anything that we haven't covered, this has just been a fun conversation with you, Chris. I really appreciate you uh, spending this much time with us on the air. Um, I don't think so. The only thing I would add is when something you said, when you like write something to the doctor's office before you got there, 
That is so important. Um, I love getting a list, show, looking at it, uh, because what I find invariably happens, the patient will start talking, start talking, the caregiver start talking, and now your time's done. As a physician, your time's done. You're about to walk out and they go, oh, but the most important thing. And then nobody, it's done. You're not going to do the most important thing. And so, but by having a list, showing that list before the appointment starts or right when the appointment starts is so helpful because then the important things will get addressed. Yep. Yep. I, I agree. And that, that took so much stress off of me and frustration because a lot of times I would walk out going, oh my God, how did I not mention that? <laughs> You know, because you, you got sidetracked with something. And and then I had something that was easier for me to kind of communicate into other family members and also track in terms of changes um, in my loved one as well. Because I know, I know timing of when things happen is important and families don't know to track that. It, you know, it seems like every Monday at this time, this is happening. And then all of a sudden people go back in time and go, oh, oh yeah, that's when they used to do this. And some of those things that are just ingrained in them, you know, pop out and then you, you realize new ways to be able to, to deal with things. So don't be shy about suggesting new ways to communicate or, or suggesting or asking questions that, you know, no matter what it is, you know, bring it up. Uh, you got nothing to lose by doing that and, and everything to gain and that allows you to become a true team instead of just, I'm going to the doctor. Now you're really looking like we're a team together. We're really managing this together. And that alone, I think, changes the way everybody walks out of the office and probably how the doctor feels as well. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you are a light. It's so nice to have resources <laughs> and it's going to be great to be able to refer patients to your website and say, look, check this out. So I really appreciate that. Wonderful. Now to get a hold of Chris, you can go to his site. It's chrispriceauthor.com, chrispriceauthor.com. And then if you have questions and want to email, you can contact his um, media person, Emily at mindbuckmedia.com. Emily at mindbuckmedia.com. And again, the book is Allison's Gambit. And I really recommend um, the read. I think it'll be so helpful for so many people. And once you're finished, pass it on. Don't let it just sit on your shelf. You know other people in need. So, you know, pass it on or recommend that they get their own. If you want to keep it as a resource, we understand that as well. But so often I, I see people gather things and then they, they, you know, they either learn something or they get a product and they just keep it. And, you know, the way we're going to really improve our dementia care culture is to do more sharing and getting more creative in terms of what we can do to make a difference. So I want to thank our listeners. And again, I thank Chris uh, so much for taking this much time with us today. It's really, truly been a pleasure. So thank you. All right. You're welcome. And thank you.